But the children struggled together within her, and she said, If it is so, why then am I this way? So she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two people shall be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other, the older shall serve the younger. When her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb. Now the first came forth red all over, like a hairy garment. And they named him Esau. Esau. And afterwards his brother came forth, with his hand holding onto Esau's heel. So his name was called Jacob, or Yaakov, from the Hebrew word for heel, Akov. And Isaac was 60 years old when she gave birth to them. And when the boys grew up, Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the field. But Jacob was a peaceful man, living in tents. Now Isaac loved Esau because he had a taste for game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. And when Jacob had cooked stew, Esau came in from the field, and he was famished. And Esau said to Jacob, Please let me have a swallow of that red stuff there, for I am famished. Therefore his name was called Edom. And Jacob said, First sell me your birthright. And Esau said, Behold, I'm about to die. So of what use then is this birthright to me? And Jacob said, First swear to me. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank and rose and went on his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Birthright and blessing. Turn with me, please, to Hebrews chapter 12. Novum Testamentum and Vetere Latet, the new was in the old concealed. Verse 16, or verse 15. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God, and that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble and by it many be defiled. That there be no immoral or godless person like Esau, who sold his own birthright for a single meal. For you know that even afterwards, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought for it with tears. This is what the New Testament says about Genesis 25. Now, there are two dimensions to this story of Esau and Jacob. One is the national prophetic aspect for the Jewish and Arab nations. We have a separate tape and a video dealing with that aspect, Jews and Arab, Jewish-Arab reconciliation in Christ and biblical prophecy. The struggle we see today in the Middle East originates in the struggle in Rebekah or Rivka's womb between these two brothers. And as Esau and Jacob were once reconciled, so in the prophetic destiny of God, as we read in Isaiah 19, among other places, the descendants of Esau and the descendants of Jacob will one day be reconciled in Christ. And of course, when Jews stop believing the false Judaism of the rabbis and accept Yeshua HaMashiach, and Arabs stop believing the lies of Muhammad, the false prophet, and turn to Yeshua HaMasiah, as he's known in Arabic, that reconciliation can happen already. That is one aspect. The Jews are in the character of Jacob, but the Arab nations are in the character of Esau. Now again, it's much more complicated than I'm telling you we have tapes dealing with it. God promised Esau the lands to the east. 
to be a great nation. The Jews were the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but the Arab nations are the descendants of Abraham, Ishmael, and Esau. And it's a marriage between Esau's descendants and Ishmael. You read about this in Genesis 36, the anthropological origins of the Arab nations. God promised the Arab nations all the lands to the east. They have the Persian Gulf. They have Iraq. They have the Arabian Peninsula, all of it. They have Syria. They have Jordan. And all of that petro wealth money. About 140 million Arabs in the Middle East. Compared to 4 million Jews. If you want to make numbers, land, or money, the barometer of God's blessing, you'd have to say God has blessed the Arabs much more than he blessed the Jews. God gave them all that, but Esau still despises his birthright. He covets a land the size of Wales. On the other hand, the Jewish nation is in the character of Jacob. Although God loved Jacob and chose Jacob and wanted to bless Jacob, Jacob was always in the habit of trying to pursue the purposes of God in his own strength, through his own devices. And he kept winding up the proverbial man on back of the proverbial eight ball. That is the Jewish character. They are like Jacob. In the Bible, you will find, for instance, in Isaiah, Israel and Jacob, Israel and Jacob, Israel and Jacob. Israel is one thing, Jacob is another, after Jacob's name was changed to Israel. Christians who accept Jesus are grafted into the olive tree. What applies to Israel can also be applied to the church, usually. We can't forget what it means for Israel, first and foremostly, but in a spiritual sense, spiritually speaking, Zion is the name of all, you can say what applies to Israel can also be applied to the church. Never to the negation of what it means for Israel, but also it can apply to the church in principle. What applies to Jacob, however, is always specific for the Jews. It's ethno-specific. The Great Tribulation is called Hatekofat Hotzarat Yaakov, the time of Jacob's trouble. When you see something prophetic about Jacob, it only applies to the Jews. That cannot apply to the church. Okay? It only applies to the Jews, never to the church. Israel can have a meaning for both, but Jacob never. Okay? When Jacob wrestled with the angel of the Lord, this was a Christophany, known as the Metatron in Judaism. We also have a tape on that. This was an Old Testament manifestation of Jesus. And his name was changed from Jacob to Israel. After that, whenever he behaved like a new creation, like a spiritual man who met the Lord, the text calls him by his new name, Israel. Whenever he goes back and behaves by his own carnal devices, the text calls him by his old name, Jacob. And so it is with you and I. We're told in the book of Revelation that we have a new name. And whenever we behave like new creations, the Lord calls us by the new name that's in the book of life. When we behave according to the patterns of our old nature, then we become Philip, Barbara, Rupert, Petrus, etc. <laughs> we all have two names. We have the natural name and we have the new name. Now, that is one aspect. That is one aspect. Jacob had a grudge born against him by Esau. His brother bore a grudge. Arabs to this day bear a grudge. On the other hand, Jacob did not treat his brother fairly. And while I believe in the right of Israel to exist, and I believe the Jews are back in Israel in fulfillment of prophecy, I also can tell you there have been injustices committed against the Arabs. Not nearly as bad as what the Muslims do to each other. And nothing like what the Muslims do to the Christian Arabs. But there have been injustices, but no one told you otherwise. Jacob is still, there has been supplanting from his brother. Israel is not a righteous nation, it's an unrighteous nation. Now, both the Jewish and Arab nations have a plan 
in God's plan for prophecy, but nations that reject Jesus are not righteous nations. They're unrighteous. Doesn't mean that God doesn't love them. Doesn't mean he doesn't have a prophetic destiny for them. But it does mean that they're unrighteous nations. Don't forget, ultimately, that Jerusalem is called Sodom and Egypt, where the Lord was also crucified. Now, I believe, again, in the prophetic purpose of God for Israel and the Jews, my family are Israeli. But I also know he who is a Jew is not one outwardly, but one inwardly. Those who have been born again. Now, let's look at this. That is one aspect. The other aspect, however, is the one we're going to look at today. The birthright and the blessing. A midrash on the first and the second born. The older will serve the younger. Look again at Hebrews chapter 12. This is the other aspect. This prophetic aspect to do with the Jewish Arab nations is important in its own right. It's a other different subject which we have tapes dealing with. It's something which is very important in biblical prophecy in its own right. But now we're looking at the other aspect, the one in Hebrews 12. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God. In the Greek text, that is subjunctive, subjunctive mood. The subjunctive mood in the Greek language is very important. It implies doubt. It is a warning here to Christians specifically to Jewish Christians, but to all of us, that you can come short of the grace given you. We see this in Hebrews 6, Hebrews 12, even though people try to do monkey tricks with it. Uh, Hebrews 10, rather. Uh, you can come short of the grace. However, it's subjunctive mood. The subjunctive mood implies doubt. One example would be where Jesus said, Lest you see with your ears, see with your eyes, and he, hear with your ears, and turn to me and be healed. Lest. It was very unlikely that the Pharisees were going to turn to him. The possibility existed, but it was a subjunctive mood. It was unlikely it was going to happen. Well, so too here, it's subjunctive mood. We shouldn't worry about losing our salvation like we're walking on eggs. Okay? The Lord doesn't save people to lose them. But the possibility does exist of falling short of the grace. You understand? The possibility exists. I do believe in once saved, always saved, but it is not unconditional. Unsaved people have no free will. Only Christians have a free will. They can't choose. We can because God has given us the power. Calvinism denies that, that free will was restored. Free will was restored at the cross. Calvinists is, is, is a, is, comes from humanism and, it's an, and, and a lot of other things, and it, it, it's an error. However, having said that, it's, it's doubtful. The Lord doesn't save people to lose them. If we get off track in our Christian life and get into trouble, the Lord will reprimand us. He will cause circumstances to go against us. He will judge us in this world so that we will not be judged in the world to come. He does not save people to lose them. It is a matter of doubt, but the possibility exists. And of course, when you, a root of bitterness comes in, well, that's a problem. Perhaps the clearest example of this is in the Pilgrim's Progress, the backslider in the cage, with the beard who kept yelling, eternity, eternity. I'm very amazed how many Christians have never read the Pilgrim's Progress. I think after the Bible, it is the best book I've ever read in my life. If you want to understand Christianity, read the Pilgrim's Progress. After the Bible, that's the best book I have ever read to this day. After the Bible. What are you laughing at? Don't you like the Pilgrim's Progress? <laughs> oh, good. I went to the synagogue on Yom Kippur. <laughs> we were listening to the Kol Nidre. Everybody else was talking about business. <laughs> this has been a very difficult Yom Kippur for us. Outside the synagogue we go to in Leeds, we go to the Messianic Fellowship, on, but we also go to the synagogue for high holidays for cultural reasons and to make friends with, with, with unsaved Jews to, to share the gospel with them. And so we were there, 
And of course, being in Leeds, we're next to Bradford with the high Asian population, and there's rows of security to get into the building. You've got to know this person and have a reference. They're all nervous about letting, letting people in they don't know. But how unfortunate it is that you have to have these security guards in front of the synagogue. But then, just a two days earlier, now someone in Texas is talking about putting on in front of churches. Baptist church to a youth meeting and shot kids screaming, I hate Jesus Christ, I hate Jesus Christ, and again, shooting these kids. What are we coming to? It's not just the synagogue, it's the church. Very tragic. Anyways, well, have a good time with Doubting Castle and the Slough of Despond and the Wicked Gate. <laughs> In any event, see to it that none of you comes short of it. Instead of the living, understand the contrast. Jesus said you'll become a spring of living water welling up to life. Instead of living water welling up, look what it says springs up inside of you. A root of bitterness that will cause trouble, and by many are defiled. Now this is using the resentment of Esau against his brother. However, understand the analogy. God took away the bitterness of Esau, didn't he? And God can take away a root of bitterness from us. You understand what it's saying? The, it's a subjunctive mood. The Lord doesn't save people to lose them. It's doubtful, but it is possible. Now, it continues. He was immoral because he despised his birthright and he sold it for a single meal. Going back to Genesis 25, we have to understand a few things. In the Greek language, we have multiple words for love. Seven. Seven words for love in Greek, three of which are found in the New Testament, agape, filio, and eros, and a fourth called storga, which is implied. In English, we can distinguish between like and love. We have two words. In Hebrew, however, we have a complication. You only have one word, ahava, ahava. That is one of the reasons why the New Testament was at least primarily written in Greek. People from a Semitic culture would know the nuances of a text and what it meant. But people from another culture would misunderstand what it meant. The Greek language was more lengthy, more exact. It's difficult to be precise communicating cross-culturally, you understand? So we have the lingua franca, we have the Greek, where it was more easy to use precise terms. Now, let's understand this. When it says that Jacob was loved by his mother, Rivka, Rebecca, but Esau was loved by his father, Isaac, it doesn't mean that Isaac didn't love Jacob or that Rebecca didn't love Esau. It meant favorite, liked. I like this one better than that one. This is not a good thing. It is important that we allow our children to know that they are all co-equally loved and co-equally valued. Parents can inadvertently engender sibling rivalries that can cause a root of bitterness that will follow children even to adulthood. It is not a good thing for Christian parents or any parents, certainly not believing parents, to do that. I know a shop in Ireland with 11 children, 11. No favorites. He doesn't like any of them. <laughs> <laughs> Terrible. Now we have to understand this. This conflict between the firstborn and the second, the older and the younger, is a continuous theme throughout the book of Genesis. It repeats, it recapitulates, it keeps coming back in Genesis, and it projects 
forward into the rest of the Bible, all the way into the New Testament. It begins with Cain and Abel, the tension between the firstborn and the second, the older and the younger, the younger being the one who got the favor. Then it goes to Ishmael and Abraham, doesn't it? The firstborn and the second, the one born of, born of the flesh, the slave woman and the other one. So I'll, what am I saying? Abraham's sons, Ishmael and Isaac. Then it goes to Jacob and Esau. Then it goes to Jacob and his older brothers, especially Judah. It continues throughout Genesis. But it begins with Cain and Abel. Now that is one aspect has to do with biblical prophecy of the Jewish and Arab nations. That's settled, that's important, but that's separate. How do we understand the conflict between the first and second born, the older serving the younger? Turn with me, please, to the book of Galatians, chapter 4, St. Paul's Midrash on the story of the first and second born. No one using Western hermeneutics or Western methods of interpreting the Bible would be able to agree with Paul's exegesis of, of, of Genesis 16, the story of Isaac and and Ishmael. But let's see how Paul explains this idea of the first and second born and the conflict between them. Let's look. Verse 22, for it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the bondwoman and one by the free woman. But the son of the bondwoman was born according to the flesh, and the son of the free woman through the promise. This is allegorically speaking, for these two women are two covenants, one proceeding from Mount Sinai bearing children who are to be slaves. She is Hagar. Now, this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present Jerusalem. In other words, the law. For she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free. She is our mother. For it is written, Rejoice, barren woman, who does not bear. And this comes, I believe, from Isaiah chapter 54, verse 1. Break forth and shout, you who are not in labor, for more are the children of the desolate one than the one who has a husband. And you, brethren, like Isaac, are children of promise. But as at that time, he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the spirit, so it is now also. But what does the scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be an heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of a bondwoman, but of the free woman. The firstborn is the one who is born of the flesh. The secondborn is the one who is born of the spirit. The one who was born of the flesh corresponds to earthly Jerusalem and is under the law. The one who is born of the spirit is the one is of heavenly Jerusalem and is free from the law. The law teaches us about ourselves through the example of the Jewish nation. I don't have a balloon. I need to begin carrying one around when I do this. I take it no one else has a balloon, so perhaps someone has a plastic sandwich bag. Does anyone have a plastic sandwich bag they don't need? Gulp down the cookie and give me the bag. <laughs> Thank you. Anyway, the law of gravity, the person who explained this best was the Chinese Christian 
watch the knee. I don't know anybody who understood this or explained it better than this Chinese guy who was from a brethren background called Watchman Nee. Leave it to the Lord to find a Chinaman to explain a Jewish religion. <laughs> In New York, my native city, as you can tell by my accent, we actually have a kosher Chinese restaurant called Bernstein's. <laughs> the law of gravity says that because of gravity, a balloon will fall. Right? Gravity says it must fall. It has no choice but to fall. The magnetic pull of the Earth will make it fall. If I were to blow air into a balloon, the balloon would still fall, but only at a slightly slower pace. That is like religion. Religion will never stop you from sinning. As a matter of fact, it'll only conjure up the desire to sin. The reason it won't stop you from sinning is it is not powerful enough to overcome the law of gravity. It'll only make you do it slower, but then eventually you'll do it. And Paul even tells us it will incite, the law will work in us to incite the desire to sin. When you begin telling people they can't, because of fallen human nature, they'll want to. Okay? Uh, this is horrible music out here. That might help a bit. Sorry. Just afraid the tape will pick it up, you see. Phones, why do they need to blast it like that? If that's what they want, why can't they put on earphones? Sorry about this. In any event, gravity says it'll fall. Religion will only make you sin at a slower pace, but sin you will. And when you begin forbidding things to people, it'll make them want to do it. And in fact, will even make them worse, as Paul said. Look at the Roman Catholic Church. They forbid sex to their clergy. So in Ireland, every week, another one of their priests, and sometimes nuns, are sent to prison for pedophilia. However, if I were to pump helium into this balloon, helium is lighter than the air in our atmosphere. You have a pressure gradient. Helium will allow the balloon to float because a stronger law has now taken over. The law of buoyancy in physics is a stronger law than the law of gravity. When someone is born again, the Holy Spirit comes inside of us. That's like the helium. We don't have to fall. Again, unsaved people must sin. The most they can choose is how, when, where, but never if. Christians have a choice. Christians have a choice. We don't have to practice sin. Okay? The helium is inside of us. Unsaved people, they're slaves. The law shows you're enslaved. In the Pilgrim's Progress, remember he was wrestling with old Moses? The more you try to justify yourself with the works righteousness, forget about it. The law shows us what we are. There's nothing wrong with the law. It just shows us there's something wrong with us. The firstborn and the secondborn, the one under the law and the one under grace. The firstborn is the old creation. The secondborn is the new creation. You understand? The natural man, the natural woman, the old creation is under the law. It is a slave to sin. But the slave cannot be co-heir with the free son. You understand? People in unbelieving churches, like the Roman church, or in cults like the Jehovah's Witnesses or the Mormons, they are slaves. They're trying to be saved by good works, knocking on doors or going to novenas. Muslims are slaves. 
Orthodox Jews trying to be saved by the mitzvot are slaves. They can't stop sinning. They're slaves. They can't be heirs with three sons, the firstborn and the second. The old creation is under the law. This means the old must serve the new. The firstborn must serve the second. The properties, we'll come to this in a moment. Let's go back to the beginning of this, though. Turn to Cain and Abel, Genesis chapter 4. Reshit Perek Dalet. Genesis 4, the story of Cain and Abel. Now the man had relations with his wife Eve, and she conceived and gave birth to Cain, and she said, I've gotten a man-child with the help of the Lord. Now that phrase may be italicized in your Bible, with the help of the Lord. It does not occur in the Hebrew text. The Hebrew text simply says, et Yehovah. There are some scholars, a minority of them, who suggest that Eve thought the baby was divine. It just says, Et Adonai, with the Lord, or even the Lord. It could be translated that way. Technically, it could be translated that way. That idea of, of with the help of has been inserted, but it's not in the original text. I'm not saying that they are right, those who say she thought that the baby could have been God, but I'm saying that I can't totally rule it out based on what the original Hebrew says either. She knows that uh, salvation would come by the seed of the woman, and Adam and Eve might have understood that that meant that God had to become a man. Okay? In any event, that's not what I'm looking at. She conceives this child, and his name is Cain. Okay. Now, Cain is born, and the story continues. Cain means the gotten one, the one who, who got. And again, she gave birth to his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of flocks, but Cain a tiller of the ground. Abel in Hebrew is Hebel. Hebel. I suppose you would translate Hebel as insignificant. Insignificant. The firstborn sees the secondborn as insignificant. The old creation sees the new one as insignificant. The world sees Christians as insignificant. As it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, not many of us were people of stature or status in the secular world. Christians are seen by the world as insignificant. That which is born of flesh sees that which is born of spirit as insignificant. You understand? Now notice, Cain was a keeper of vineyards, but able creature, keeper of flocks. Man only became carnivorous with the fall. Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. Thus, the animal skins had to cover Adam and Eve's nakedness. Nakedness meaning they did not have the garments of salvation. Without the shedding of blood, there would be no forgiveness of sins, as the sages would later translate Leviticus 17 and the Septuagint. Before this, man had been herbivorous. Now he's carnivorous. In other words, Cain did something that man did before he sinned. Abel did something that man only did after he sinned. You understand? That's important. It's showing the contrast between the natural, the first and second, the natural and the supernatural. Now, the story then continues. So it came about in the course of time that Cain brought an offering to the Lord of the fruit of the ground. And Abel on his part also bought of the firstlings of the flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering. But for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain became very angry and his countenance fell. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry and why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, 
Will not your countenance be lifted up? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must master it. And Cain told Abel his brother, and it came about when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and killed him. Nakedness in the Bible is again, as Isaiah said, not having the garments of salvation. It's not talking about the beach in Eilat or the beach in Maui. Adam and Eve, we have this on the other tapes on the fig tree, tried to justify themselves by sowing fig leaves together, didn't they? We're told in Revelation that the fig leaves are for the healing of the nations. Fig leaves are figures or metaphors for good works in the Bible. Unsaved people will always try to justify themselves with good works. You understand? Separate subject, that's the reason Jesus cursed the fig tree. Israel had to work righteousness but didn't have the fruit of the Spirit. It was only leaves, not fruit. Now, this is much more complicated than I'm telling you. You can get the tapes. Understand this. That's why God did not regard the offering of Cain, but only Abel, shedding of blood, forgiveness of sins. What's the problem? He bought the right offering, you didn't. Sin's trying to master you, but you can do well. I can accept your offering. But he didn't want it. He didn't want it on God's terms. He wanted it on his terms. So he despised his younger brother. He despised the secondborn who was insignificant. The older hates the younger. The old creation hates the new one. Why? Because he considers him insignificant or her insignificant, but still resents the fact that God will accept the insignificant one's worship. Only the second born, only the one who's born again, only the second creation, only the one who's free can bring worship to God. The firstborn, the old creation, cannot bring the acceptable worship. Only the secondborn. You understand? So the world looks down upon Christians, but there's also a resentment because somehow the world knows that they're in futility and resents the fact that God accepts our worship but doesn't accept the world's. So there's a resentment. Now again, we're told in Galatians that these two sons, the first and second born, correspond to our two natures, doesn't it? The one born under the law and the one born free. So the second born can bring worship, the first born can't. The second born is considered insignificant by the first born, and the first born hates him as a result and kills him. It then continues with what we read about in Galatians. Isaac and Ishmael, the son of the free woman. The firstborn is under the law. He's a slave to sin. The secondborn is free. Then it goes to Esau and to Jacob, which we'll come back to. That's our main text today. But then it continues even further. Turn to Genesis 37, please. Verse 8, then his brothers, Joseph's older brothers, said to him, are you really going to reign over us? Are you really going to rule over us? So they hated him even more. The secondborn does not want to be subjugated, of, the firstborn does not want to be subjugated to the secondborn. I'm older than you are. I'm bigger than you are. I'm more clever than you are. You're going to rule over me? The natural man, the natural woman, does not want to be subjugated to the new creation. My intellect, my likes, my dislikes, my ability, I'm going to make what I am and what I have subject to you. Human intellect is a good servant but a bad master. 
Human emotion is also a good servant, but it is a dangerous, lethal master. People who substitute intellect for God's leading are not very wise. But those who substitute reason for emotion are just foolish people. Be careful of people who think with their emotions. They are dangerous people. And today in charismatic circles, you have people thinking with their emotions, calling it spiritual, thinking they're being spiritual, thinking it's and being irrational, thinking it's unspiritual to be rational. <laughs> It may be unspiritual to be ruled by your intellect, but it is, <laughs> that's carnal. But it is even worse to be ruled by your emotion. And it, the worst of all is not to know the difference. Human intellect is a good servant, but a bad master. Human emotion is also a good servant, but it is a deadly master. Okay? The firstborn does not want to subjugate its intellect and its emotions, the functions of its soul to the new creation. The new creation will rule over it because the new creation is the communion with God. You understand? So you have this resentment. You're going to rule over us? You're insignificant. You think you can worship God and I can't? The older hates the younger. Now let's understand this birthright. Turn with me, please, to Deuteronomy 21. Verse 15, if a man has two wives, the one loved and the other unloved, and both the loved and the unloved have borne him sons, if the firstborn son belongs to the unloved, it shall be in the day he wills what he has to his sons. He cannot make the son of the loved the firstborn before the son of the unloved, who is the firstborn. But he shall acknowledge the firstborn, the son of the unloved, by giving him a double portion of all he has, for he is the beginning of his strength. To him belongs the right of the firstborn. The right. The birthright. In the ancient Near East, which you will still find in Bedouin and Druze cultures and in certain Yemenite Jewish cultures, the firstborn has a double portion of the inheritance. The firstborn in addition to a double portion of the inheritance, gets the headship of the family or the tribe. Okay? This is a big deal in the ancient Near East. It was protected by God's law later on when God gave the Torah, but it was even protected by common law before then. It was a right, a birthright. Notice, nobody could take it. Your father could not take your birthright and give it to your brother. Nobody could take your birthright. God himself would not take your birthright. The law could not take your birthright. Your parents could not take your birthright. But you could sell it. And Esau, being a carnal man, sold it for a plate of red stew. Just a little concerned about the tape picking up the, the noise, the background noise. Now let's understand this. When we are born again, we receive a birthright. John chapter 1, verse 12. Who are born not of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. To them he gave the right to become children of God. You have a birthright. No man can take it. No church can take it. No government can take it. No law can take it. God himself will not take it. What Hebrews is saying to us in chapter 12 is what a tragedy it is when a Christian sells it for a plate of red Okay. What should be treasured is despised.
Now let's understand this. Look at his name, Esau. Esau. He comes out, he's born red. The Hebrew word for red is Edom. In the Middle East, if it's not sand, the soil has a reddish clay in it. It has a reddish color to it. If you come with us to Israel in April, I will show you. Therefore, the Hebrew word for earth is called Adama. Edam Adama. Adam was made from the earth. Therefore, the man made from the earth is called Adam. Adam. Edom, Adama, Adam. Anthropologists tell us that some North American Indians have a tradition that the first man was a red man. The Hebrew word for a human being is called a Ben Adam. A Ben Adam, literally a son of Adam, the one who was red. Understand? In 1 Corinthians 15, we read that in God's economy, there are generically only two men, the first Adam and the second. You're either of Adam or you're of Jesus. When you're born, you're of Adam. You're red. When you're born again, you're of the second Adam. Adam and Christ at Jesus were the only two people created directly by God without procreation. And they're the only two who had no sin to begin with. The first Adam fell, the second didn't. You're either in the first Adam Esau gets his name changed to, what does it say his name changed to? Edom. And he goes to southern Jordan, opposite the, Red, the, the Dead Sea, and he settles in a land where the mountains are red. And that land in the south of Jordan, where Petra is, is called Edom. You understand? Notice how many times the word red occurs in Genesis 25. He's born red. His name is changed to red. He goes, lives in a land that's red, and he sells his birthright for a plate of, what color is the stew? Red speaks of what is natural to fallen man. It's what is natural to us. It's the color of blood. It's natural. Red goes to red. Give me some of that red stuff there. Unsaved people or carnal Christians will always go to what is natural to them. You understand? Red goes to red. Red goes to red. So his name is changed to red. Jacob's name is changed to Israel. The old and new creation. Why is it red? The earth. Remember those whose names are written on the earth? But the ones who wrestled with God and prevailed, their names are written in the book of life, a new name. You understand the difference? You understand how, what I'm saying here? In light of what we, if you weren't here this morning, it doesn't make as much sense to you. Now, let's take this further. The characteristics of the firstborn, of the natural man, exemplified in the character and behavior and personality of Esau, as Hebrews tells us. The first thing we see, we all right over there? The first characteristic of the firstborn, the firstborn, the natural man, the old creation, the natural woman demands instant gratification. 
Red goes to red. The old creation demands instant gratification. I want it now. It's like teenagers wanting sex before marriage. I want it now. I want it now. It is carnal to demand instant gratification. If you look for instant gratification, you wind up forfeiting what God really has for you. You despise your birthright. You know, I was like most people. I didn't grow up Christian. I didn't know what a born-again Christian was until I got to university. Like most people, I slept around. Nobody likes the idea, even as a Christian, that you are not the first one to sleep with your husband or you're not the first one to sleep with your wife. Nobody likes that. The Lord forgives the sin. Yes, he does. Yes, he does. But you realize it would have been better off <laughs> had you not demanded instant gratification. Now, we do these things before we're Christians. I was as big a slut as anybody, maybe worse. But these things take a toll on you, don't they? It's the natural man, the natural woman. Red goes to red. I want it now. But it's a lot more, a lot more than sexuality. I want it now. Why do you think people will get on an airplane and go to Pensacola or somewhere to thinking they're going to be spiritual? As if God can't meet them where they are. What are they chasing? Instant spirituality? If you get somebody to blow on you or lay hands on you, you're going to be spiritual all of a sudden? I want it now. You want to be spiritual, pick up your cross and follow Jesus. Persevere in your prayer life. Lead others to Christ. You understand? Overcome the desires of the flesh. That's the way to be spiritual. No, no, I want it now. Just blow on me and I'll have it. <laughs> this is carnality. Only the carnality is being called spirituality. It's the second-born masquerading, the first-born masquerading as the second. Paul says, Know ye not, you are temples of the Holy Ghost. In other words, he's taking the architecture of the temple and saying that's what we're like. The temple was triune. It was a box in a box in a box. The outer court of the temple corresponds to our physical body. Everybody could see it and come in contact with it. Even pagans could see the outer courts of the temple. The holy place is our soul. But man is body, soul, and spirit. Our soul is our mind, our emotions, our intellect, things like that. That's the holy place. Keep your mind holy. But inside of our soul is another box. That's our spirit. The holy of holies. The sanctum sanctorum. What the Jews call the Kodesh Kodeshim. Where God's spirit dwells. God's spirit is in our spirit. Okay. A box and a box and a box. In the Bible, we have two words for dealing with demonic uh, invasion of us. The first word is ekbalo, and the second word is therapeo, where you get the word therapy or heal. Okay. Ek is the Greek prefix meaning out. Okay. Balo is the Greek word, we get the word ballistic. 
doesn't mean pass out. A better word would be shoot out or throw out. Throw out. It's a forceful word. In the Bible, whenever somebody was demon-possessed, it meant that instead of God's spirit in their spirit, there was a demon. You can't witness to somebody demon-possessed. You have to cast the demon out of them. Okay? If you cast a demon out of an unsaved person, out, out of somebody, and they don't get saved, more comes back. It won't work. Brings back his friends with them. They get worse. There's no point in casting a demon out of somebody if they don't get saved. But those demons will come back and come back again. It will be worse. When somebody is demon possessed, you've got a demon in, in their spirit. You can't even witness to somebody demon possessed till the demons cast out. If they're under that possession at the time. However, there's also demonic oppression. When someone is under demonic oppression, you have a demonic affliction of either the body or the soul or both. You understand? When you have demonic oppression, the Greek word is never ekbalo. It is healed. We read the rest of the Bible through the prism of the apostles' writings, the epistles. Think of the epistles as you would inspired commentary. We read the rest of the Bible through the prism of the epistles. If you want to know what Leviticus means, well, begin by reading Hebrews. If you want to know what the law means, begin by reading Romans and Galatians. If you want to know what the teaching of Jesus meant, read what the apostles said about it. Okay? You read the rest of the Bible through the prism of the epistles. We have the Pauline epistles of Paul, the Johannine epistles of John, the Petrine epistles of Peter. We have Jude, we have Hebrews, we have James, etc. We have pastoral epistles, we have epistles to churches, to individuals. The epistles deal with the practical issues of Christian life. They deal with ministry, body life, prophecy, gifts of the Spirit. They deal with all kinds of things. But the things the epistles talk about the most is how to live a Christian life in a fallen world. Our conduit. How to deal with the world, the flesh, and the devil. Not one time, not one place in all of the instructions that the apostles give on how to deal with the world, the flesh, and the devil do they ever teach deliverance. In fact, the, world, the word deliverance never appears in the Bible in the sense that people use it today. The word itself was only found a few times, but ever in connection with what people are using it for today. The word's not even in there. When the apostles say, deal with the devil, it's take up your cross, crucify the flesh, things like that. Why is it in all the instructions that the apostles give in dealing with the world, the flesh, the devil, the old nature, not one time, not one place do they teach deliverance? What do these people know that the apostles didn't? Why is it that after Jesus died and rose from the dead and the Holy Spirit was poured out on the church, poured out on Jesus and then onto the church, why is it that never one time, never one place in the Bible is the word ekbalo ever used in connection with the saved Christian camp out? You do not have any biblical basis for deliverance whatsoever. It is an invention of men that puts people into bondage. 
promising them freedom, they put them in chains. Who's getting the demons cast out this week? The same ones who got them cast out last week. Did their lives change? No. Where's your biblical basis? They don't have any. Well, they'll say, well, Jesus did it. In what context did he do it? Not the context they're doing it, but what the apostle said. When you see people teaching deliverance, you're looking at somebody who is either ignorant in that area, or they're a con man. And there's a lot of money in deliverance ministry. There's books, there's videos, there's one guy running a place called L.L. L. Grange in the north of England based on it. The guy himself is divorced from his wife and remarried. He's going to cast a demon out of somebody. He ought to stand in front of the mirror and begin with himself. He left his wife. It's a disgrace. You don't leave your wife if you're a Christian. He's going to minister to you. He's living that way. That place ought to burn to the ground. They don't give you deliverance. They give you bondage. Why do people fall for this garbage? Because they want instant gratification. Instead of picking up the cross, instead of discipleship, instead of persevering in my prayer life, I'll just get the demon cast out. Then I'll be spiritual. I'll go to Pepsi Cola and get somebody to blow on me. I'll be spiritual. What I always tell people, when I see a deliverance service, I pick up the phone. Hello? I understand you have a deliverance service this evening. You do. Good. Send over two cheeseburgers with raw onions. Don't forget the coleslaw. <laughs> Going down in the spirit. Sorry if you know this. In the Bible, it was a once in a lifetime life changing experience. The people were terrified. God had to send an angel to John or to Daniel saying, don't be afraid. They didn't want it to happen again. Today they get back in line. Push them down. Weren't you just up here a half hour ago? Yeah, now I have a headache. <laughs> dumb is dumb and getting dumber. Why did they do this? You notice in the Bible, whenever it happened, the only time they ever went backward was when they came to arrest Jesus. It was a judgment. Any time it was God really in it in a positive way, they went forward. These guys had catchers. <laughs> oh, why do people get back in line like this? They go to meetings to fall down. Why? They're looking for instant gratification, instant spirituality, a shortcut to picking up the cross, a shortcut to reading the Bible, a shortcut to... Why do people get into these gimmicks and fads and alpha and stuff like that? They want a shortcut to revival. If we just get the right program, we'll get the revival. I was in Australia about a month ago, and I got a copy of the newspaper headline in Australia, front page. And of course, the press jumped all over it and twisted it beyond even what he said, but what he said was bad enough. George Carey, the Archbishop of Canterbury, we can't be sure that Jesus rose from the dead. Paul says, if Christ is not risen, we're the most foolish of all men. So the born-again evangelical alpha course, charismatic Archbishop of Canterbury, because we can't be sure the basis of our faith is even real. We can't be, I'm positive he rose from the dead. You know what? Muslims believe they will die believing, unless they get saved, that the angel Gabriel appeared to Muhammad in a cave in Saudi Arabia and gave him the Koran. That never happened, but a Muslim would die with his dying breath, confess it happened. No angel named Moroni appeared to Joseph Smith and gave him the kinder hook plates. But a Mormon with his dying breath will confess he believed it. Jesus Christ, however, did raise from the dead. 
But a born-again, evangelical, charismatic, alpha course, Archbishop says, well, we can't be sure. <laughs> if you were looking for truth, where would you go? To the mosque? To the Mormons? Or to the church? I'd, if I was looking for truth and I wasn't already saved by the grace of God, I'd go to the cults of New Eastern religion, too. At least they believe what they, they, they believe what they say they believe. I'm going to tell you a tale of two churches. No shortcuts. In 1987, I went to my native New York from Israel. On 43rd Street, I spoke to David Wilkerson, who had recently arrived from Texas to open a church in Times Square and a little auditorium that then had to move to a movie theater and now to a big, massive Broadway theater with thousands of people. When he came to that city, he had no building, he had nothing. The crime rate had gone through the roof. There was a murder every four to six hours, most of them unsolved. Much of it, crack cocaine dealers shooting other crack cocaine dealers. Prostitutes as young as the age of 11, addicted to cocaine, crack cocaine, and heroin, controlled by pimps who controlled them with the drugs. Transvestite prostitutes, 147 licensed sex shops in Midtown Manhattan. Homeless, youth, vagrancy. This was a city in trouble. Very few evangelical churches, and most of them have been. He comes. He knew there was no way out. The emphasis was on prayer and fasting, on evangelism, on preaching the truth, on emphasizing the return of Jesus. Now, around Times Square, even unsaved people and news agencies and hairstylists, uh, Kofiers, are talking about this church. I was there in December. They've moved three times and have several other buildings. If you get there on time, you won't even get into the building. If you Get there an hour early, you'll get in and you'll get a seat. But just get there an hour early and queue up, not Sunday, every day of the week, multiple services on Sunday. Every meeting, there are people saved in it. This is not a church that's grown like Sunderland or something like this, or Toronto, people leaving Church A for Church B to have their ears pickled. This is a church that grew by people being saved. This is not the purpose-driven church stuff. It's not the... Willow Creek stuff, it's not the Bill Heibel stuff, it's, it, this is grown by people being saved. In their rescue mission, where I once taught a Bible study called the Upper Room, every day, pimps saved, prostitutes saved, homeless kids saved, drug addicts saved, drug dealers saved, transvestites saved, every day. Every day. The crime rate in New York City, they began praying for the city. The city began putting this zero tolerance stuff into effect. The crime rate in New York City has gone down 30% in the last four years. The murder rate, however, the murder rate has gone below 1964 level. There is less murder in New York now than there was 35 years ago. Of the 147 licensed sex shops in Midtown Manhattan, all but 44 are closed down. Now they're showing like Laurel and Hardy movies where they used to show. What else? Drug dealers are gone, pimps are gone, prostitutes are gone. From the streets, that stuff was so terrible, so much of it, that the theater and restaurant industry, the Broadway theaters, that's like what the West Enders in London were being choked out of business. Now it's all Walt Disney shops, family shopping. I had seen the real and I had seen the counterfeit. <laughs> However, when God began to work like this, the devil attacked. If you know what the Stonewall movement is, it is the militant homosexual and lesbian movement. It began in New York. They're very big, a lot of them, very well financed and very militant, radical. The homosexual community in New York was determined to produce a Broadway play of Jesus Christ and his quote-unquote gay lover. 
And they were in the newspapers, on radio and on TV, the media every day, saying, we will not be discriminated against by these homophobic bigots who are against our play. The big militant homosexual organizations in New York. They were protesting and everything. David Wilkerson's people, two blocks or one and a half blocks from where the play was supposed to open, were down on the floor every day. On the floor, literally. They were fasting and praying and weeping before the Lord, dear God, do not allow the name of your son to be degraded in our city like this, that your judgment will not come upon us. That play never opened. I've seen the real. Meanwhile, back in London, homosexual clergy, men and women with clerical collars, were determined to have a gay and lesbian service before the BBC and ITV news cameras and Southern Cathedral, where Christians were arrested and taken off to be martyred during the reign of Queen Mary. The English used to call her Bloody Mary in the aftermath of the Reformation a place where Christians were persecuted and martyred. And these homosexual lesbian clergy said, we are not going to be discriminated against by these homophobic bigots. Meanwhile, at Holy Trinity Brompton, home of the Alpha Course, St. Andrew's Chorley Wood, Kensington Temple, Westminster Chapel, the big evangelical churches in the neighborhood, around London. You know, the highest abortion rate in the UK of any council, borough district council, Westminster, Kensington, Chelsea, home of Westminster Chapel, Kensington Temple, and Holy Trinity Brompton have the highest abortion rates in the Meanwhile, at Holy Trinity Brompton, home of the Alpha Course, this is their own denomination now, Westminster Chapel and Kensington Temple, Holy Trinity Brompton, their leaders also had them on the floor. Only they were not on the floor fasting and praying. They were not on the floor weeping. At the behest of their leaders, Nicky Gumbel, Colin Dye, Wynn Lewis. This is not, everybody knows this. R.T. Kendall, David Pitches, they were also on the floor. Not fasting, weeping, or praying. They were barking like dogs. They were rolling around in drunken hysterics, said God was doing a great thing. With the real move of God, they got the homosexuals out of a theater. Holy Trinity Brompton with their Toronto and Alpha couldn't even get them out of a church. I have seen the counterfeit, and I have seen the real. You have the counterfeit. If God can do that in New York, there's not a city in the world he can't do it in, including London. The problem is you don't have David Wilkerson. Bad people. Why do people think that by doing this crazy stuff, they were going to have a revival? That they're going to see the homosexuals push back in England and get off the air, get off television? Why do they think that by, by barking like dogs and, and, and being drunk, they're going to get daytime TV off BBC too? <laughs> they couldn't even get them out of a cathedral. Do they think they're going to see righteousness established in this nation again by doing that? Now why? Instant gratification. It is carnal Christianity. The old nature. Red goes to red. Turn with me very briefly to Isaiah chapter 30.
Verse 1, woe to the rebellious children, declares the Lord. They execute a plan, but not mine. They make an alliance, but not of my spirit. They add sin to sin. They proceed down to Egypt without consulting me to take refuge in the safety of Pharaoh. They seek shelter in the shadow of Egypt. But the safety of Pharaoh will be to your disgrace and the shelter and the shadow of Egypt, your humiliation. From 1 Corinthians 10, what is Egypt a figure of in the Bible? The world. Pharaoh is a figure of the devil and a type of the Antichrist. The Egyptians deified him. They went to Egypt without consulting him. King Hezekiah was in a strategically pressed scenario. He had the Assyrian threat on one side coming at him from the east and the Egyptians on the west. And he was being badly advised to go to Egypt for help. The problem was he was being told to do that without consulting the Lord. Whenever you get involved with Egypt, it's Pharaoh's kingdom. We consult the Lord. You get involved with the world's legal system, you better consult the Lord. You get involved with the world's financial system, you better consult the Lord. You get involved with its hospital system, you better consult the Lord. You send your kids to a state school, you get involved with its education system, you better consult the Lord. We never get involved with the world without the Lord's direction. But red goes to red. You see, in a crisis, people will take a false sense of security in what the world looks to. That's what Isaiah continues saying in chapter 31. Woe to those who go to Egypt for help. They rely on horses and trust in chariots because they are many. But they do not look to the Holy One of Israel or seek the Lord. Red goes to red, especially in a crisis. The natural propensity of the flesh is to go to what the world considers strong before you go to the Lord. Now understand this. This is carnality. Give me some of that red stuff. I'll go down in the spirit. He'll blow on me. I'll go to Pensacola. I'll get the demon cast out. We'll get this. Then we'll have it. This is carnality. It's a demand for instant gratification. Only what the Bible calls carnal today is being misrepresented as spiritual. You understand? As discipleship. The second characteristic we see follows suit. These things are synergistic. One begets the other, and they make it worse. Synergy is something you can explain better mathematically than you can verbally. It's in physics, it's in medicine, it's in all science, but one example would be that everybody's, everybody's familiar with is the wind chill factor. You go up to the highlands of Scotland in the winter, say it is five degrees Celsius, and say that you have a cross wind is 40 miles an hour. The cold makes the wind seem stronger than it is, and the wind makes the cold seem stronger than it is. So the two of them together, have a combined impact that's quite greater than either one individually. It's like the sum of the components is greater than each of, uh, I don't know how to, you know what I mean. The, the sum is greater than each of the components individually. Okay? These things beget each other. So when you have a demand for instant gratification, the next thing we see is you become predisposed to being swindled. When you demand instant gratification, you become prone to being conned. If somebody wants instant gratification, you can bet there'll be somebody there to sell it to you. You want instant spirituality? You can bet that the devil will have a Benny Hinn or a Rodney Brown or a Wynn Lewis to sell it to you. That's the way it works. Just spiritual con artists. That's all it is. Become predisposed to being swindled. His brother took him right in. The third thing about the firstborn, the old creation, it confuses what it needs with what it wants. 
This is very easy to happen in a consumerist society. You have psychologists employed by the advertising industry on Madison Avenue in New York and Covent Gardens in England who tell companies how to convince people they need things they don't. Sometimes they invent the product with no market for it and then have to construct the market to find a way to sell the product. This is a practical thing. When I am stuck on the demonic motorway system of this country, because of the lorries backed up all over the place, because Dr. Beeching tore up the railroads, and now we are paying an environmental cost, I get very angry at Dr. Beeching, and a root of bitterness springs up in my soul. <laughs> So I'm on my way to a meeting, maybe a big meeting like last night with a lot of people, and I'm stuck in traffic. So I pick this up and I say, Pastor, will you sing a few extra hymns? I'm stuck in traffic again. I'm back to the demonic lorries and roadworks, which always have to take place because the lorries tear up the macadam. What did I do before I had one of these? I used to pull over on the motorway into a services put some money into a payphone and do the same thing. It's a practical thing to happen, to have. It is a practical thing. I'm not saying it isn't. But it's so difficult in the modern world to distinguish between a need and a want. I've had people complain to me in England, there's no church where we live, the nearest one that's any good, that's not into the error, is, 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 is over 10 miles away. I just got back from Asia. Imagine a mother with no shoes and a baby on her back like a papoose walking 15 miles through the jungle to get to a meeting, and that's the highlight of her week. <laughs> that happens in the Philippines. 15 miles with no shoes and a kid on her back going through the jungle in the rain. I saw a guy in, in, in Lesotho in Africa. Nothing but a blanket coming to a wet bush like this. You know how far that guy walked? <laughs> 30 miles. I thought nothing of it. Then I'll go 30 miles back. That's the highlight of their week. Oh, there's no church where we live. I'll have to take the bus. And I got the kids. You know? I'm not saying that these are not considerations. But in a consumer society, it's so dif difficult to distinguish a need from a want. You understand? Well, I'll tell you, one trip to the third world would open anybody's eyes. I wish every Christian in the West could take one trip to Latin America or to Africa or to Asia. I just, one trip. We confuse need with wants. I'm famished. Give me some of that stuff. I'm starving to death. He sells his birthright for instant gratification. He thinks that he needs it. Why do you think people go with these gimmicks and fads? We need this! Alpha, we need it! In our church, we need it, said the pastor. The latest blessing, we need it! What he means is, people want it, and if we don't have it, they'll go to the place up the street and we'll lose members. Therefore, we'll lose money. <laughs> it's all business. It's not ministry. Business. We need it! It doesn't know the difference between a need and a want. The fourth thing that happens, of what good is a birthright to me? Once you get to that point where you don't know the difference between what you need and what you want, your value system becomes totally contorted. You wind up forfeiting the things God really does have for you. I honestly believe, I honestly believe that if a place like Kensington Temple in London had been like David Wilkerson, they could have got the same kind of result. I remember Colin Guy was a good guy. Now, now the Elam movement is, a, I consider it to be cultic. I consider it to be cultic. Anything God had for them. They sold it for a plate of soup. They sold it for a plate of soup.
finally, I love this one. Look at Genesis chapter 26. Sorry, Genesis chapter 27, verse 36. Then he said, Is he not rightly named Jacob? For he has supplanted me these two times. He took away my birthright, and behold, now he's taken away my blessing. One, Jacob did not supplant him two times. He sold his birthright. Jacob supplanted him one time. And even that time, although Jacob was wrong, it was still a judgment for Esau's own actions. The old creation, the natural man, the natural woman, the firstborn, is a genius at blaming others for the consequences of their own actions. The old creation does not want to assume responsibility for its own decisions. It blames others. The man's instant gratification, by virtue of the fact that wants instant gratification, it makes itself prone to a swindler. Then it doesn't know the difference between what it needs and what it wants. Its value system becomes distorted, and the final analysis, it's somebody else's fault. I was misled. <laughs> we have always had carnal Christians. There's always been carnal Christians. Jude's epistle deals with it. 1 Corinthians deals with it. 2 Peter deals with it. There have always been carnal Christians. But what happens when you have carnal Christianity? When you have whole churches and whole movements who are given over to this stuff? Where the man, the instant gratification, becomes camouflaged as hungry for God. What they're hungry for is instant gratification. Experience. Where being swindled is coming under the anointing. It's just masquerade, you're being swindled. You're in Tamara Cirillo, you're being swindled. I'm sorry, that's what I believe. You're going to buy a Holy Ghost mirror language to take away debt, you're being swindled. That's what I believe. Confusing needs with wants, I need it, I want it, becomes faith confession. <laughs> Distorted values, that's not biblical. You're a Pharisee. <laughs> that's Pharisaic. Pharisaic. And blaming others, <laughs> they just move on to the next scam. <laughs> Sweep that one under the rug and get the next one. When this trend doesn't work, we get the next one. When this Toronto doesn't work, we get the sense of cold. When that doesn't work, we get the alpha. When that doesn't work, we get the gold teeth. It's going to you know what? When Jesus healed the blind man, he never gave him a C&I dog. When Jesus healed the lame man, he didn't give him a wooden leg. Why on earth, when he healed a filling, he healed the cavity, would he give you a filling? <laughs> but who's doing it? The same ones with the rest of it. What the Bible calls carnal, they are calling Christian. What is all the behavior of the firstborn, they are calling the secondborn. They despise their birthright. They sell it for a plate of stew. Then they become bitter when it doesn't work. You'll find these people who have been taken up in these trends when you challenge it and you, and you confront them, how angry they get because of the bitterness. See, they know. The older and the younger. The older hates the younger. The firstborn hates and resents the secondborn, considers him insignificant. You'll rule over us? Cain killed Abel. Ishmael probably would have killed Isaac, and Esau probably would have killed Jacob. Joseph's brothers tried to kill him. The older hates the younger. The old nature hates the new one. We'll kill him if he can. 
Remember, they were born in the same womb. Their parents couldn't tell the difference between them. So they got real close, and even then their father couldn't see. The old creation and the new one look identical. When you look in the mirror, is that Israel or Jacob? Is that the new creation or the old one? Is that the spiritual man, the spiritual woman, or is it the carnal one? Is it Esau or Jacob? Is an old man and a new man in you? And an old man and a new man in you? And they look so much alike, their own parents can't tell the difference. They are born from the same womb. And the struggle goes on. The older hates the younger. But the older must serve the younger. The older must serve the younger. The firstborn must serve the second. If the older does not serve the younger, the older will kill the younger. Dear brethren, let us see to it that not a one of us despises his birthright. God bless.